In March of 2008, University of Iowa professor Greg Carmichael forever reshaped the global warming debate. Together with atmospheric scientist V. Ramanathan, Carmichael found that soot, aka black carbon, warms the atmosphere three to four times more than previously estimated. This means soot has a greater warming effect than any other greenhouse gas, save for carbon dioxide. Carmichael and Ramanathan published their findings in Nature Geoscience. Within days, the LA Times, The Guardian, Der Spiegel, and other publications worldwide picked up on the new development. A month before the publication, Carmichael discussed his black carbon research at a symposium on climate change and human rights at the University of Iowa. The event was co-sponsored by the Center for Global and Regional Environmental Research, or CEGER, an institute Carmichael co-founded in 1990. Director of the Center for Global and Regional Environmental Research, and I'm also pleased that we're able to uh, co-sponsor this event and to have this dialogue between uh, a very important topic that spans from uh, science to uh, to policy. And so I think this is an excellent forum. And so I congratulate uh, Joe and all of his other colleagues in the uh, execution of this symposium. So I'm going to take a few minutes today and uh, talk about uh, th some of the science of uh, climate change. And I'm going to do it in a way I'm going to call ABCs of climate change because I'm going to have a very specific message that comes out of my talk today is that uh, I'm going to talk in addition to what's in the news all the time about carbon dioxide, I'm going to introduce and talk about the, uh, the effect of these atmospheric brown clouds which are really atmospheric aerosols that uh, are coming into the uh, atmosphere in the form of uh, a byproduct of coal combustion or uh, diesel uh, buses or uh, forest fires. The message that's coming out of the IPCC is the unequivocal warming of the planet. And we can look up here at the 150-year um, temperature record, which is the global mean temperature record. Uh, and you can see that uh, as we uh, proceed into uh, the end of the last decade and into uh, uh, this uh, century, this uh, increasing uh, rise in global temperature. And then we also, the next column talks about this, the scale upon which this is happening. In the case of carbon dioxide, the biggest singular, single component, it's happening global in extent. The extent that uh, the CO2 emitted in Iowa City has a global influence. Its value, its, its impact is global. So very quickly as I uh, orient you on that table and as we move, uh, move down, carbon dioxide is indeed the, the single most important component. Uh, and you can see its value there. The next one, and I'll move through these rather quickly, methane is, and the CFCs talked about earlier, which are uh, responsible for the destruction of the ozone in the stratosphere, are also very potent greenhouse gases. Methane is uh, very, very important. Uh, pollution and ozone itself, the photochemical smog that uh, we're pretty good at producing in uh, many cities around the world, in addition to its health impacts, is an important climate forcer. If we look globally at these uh, atmospheric ground cloud sources, the top figure there shows the emissions of black carbon. And you can see that it happens in the northern hemisphere as well as in the southern hemisphere. Northern hemisphere largely due to uh, anthropogenic activities uh, related to fuel combustion. You also see things over the ocean which are ship tracks, which are very, very important sources of black carbon and will be a much more important contributor to uh, global change and air pollution issues in the coming decades. You also see uh, uh, a fair amount of emissions in the southern hemisphere which are related to biomass burning, open burning forest fires, for example. So black carbon emissions occur everywhere. The middle panel talks about black carbon, so that's that soot that's coming out of these com incomplete combustion processes. And it's acts in the atmosphere like carbon dioxide. So black carbon aerosol are the only aerosol species that contribute in the same way to climate forcing as carbon dioxide. So it's an aerosol, but it's a greenhouse gas for the sake of this discussion. Aerosols block radiation reaching the surface, less radiation reaching the surface, we have a cooling temperature. 
Aerosols, along with uh, CO2, then have this perturbation, this uneven distribution, perturbation to the energy balance, which causes perturbed uh, perturbations throughout the weather system. And one of the uh, ones that's shown here is the uh, trends in drought severity index from the year uh, from 1900 to 2002. The red indicates uh, uh, areas where we have uh, uh, tendencies towards drought. And you can see that as we moved into this um, latter part of the last century, this uh, indication of uh, moving into uh, drought situations as a result of climate change in general. And I should point out this distribution of drought, when we go into our scientific models, uh, we need to include the carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gases, but we also must include the aerosols into the physical uh, environment. We know that, uh, at least from the IPC perspective, the scientific uh, uh, consensus is uh, uh, this radiative forcing component. I summarize here um, in the uh, uh, far left-hand side, you see that uh, all greenhouse gases together are contributing uh, to three watts per square meter to global forcing. Of that three, 1.6 is due to carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is the elephant in the room in terms of uh, uh, global forcing. The right side is the contribution of global forcing from these ABCs, atmospheric brown clouds. And of these aerosol mixtures in the atmosphere, the black carbon, again, I told you, is, acts like a greenhouse gas. And so it, by our estimates, uh, this is work that we've done, is contributing uh, one, 0 0.9 watts per square meter. The numbers aren't so important, but what we see there that compared to CO2, black carbon is the second most important greenhouse gas. That's our message. Second most important greenhouse gas is black carbon in, in its all, when we take all of its effects into account. 60% of that of, um, of CO2. Black carbon, in my mind, if we look about what the IPC tells us about, we know about the energy that we put into the system by climate change, that we could be heading, we're certainly buying into future warming and we could be headed over the next several decades for dangerous climate response. Black carbon, which is 60% of uh, uh, CO2 in terms of its uh, uh, greenhouse gas warming potential, offers us the opportunity by acting on black carbon now to have an intermediate solution where we can uh, starve off some of this uh, uh, global warming uh, in the next several decades. So it's a short-term policy uh, traction component that I feel is very important uh, that we should be pursuing, that black carbon we can pursue because not only is it a climate change species, but it's also intimately linked to human health outcomes and air pollution, and so it's a win-win situation. We would be doing and are doing black carbon reductions now because of the drag on the economy from the health perspectives, but what we need to recognize is that it has a very, very strong uh, uh, climate response component. The other issue about black carbon that is, is important is that that carbon dioxide molecule we released today is in the atmosphere 100 years. We automatically buy into future warming associated with that emission. Black carbon has a lifetime of one or two days. We can solve black, if we control black carbon today, then it's out of the atmosphere, uh, helping us uh, deal in the intermediate phase of uh, uh, reducing the threats of climate change but ultimately we need to move to the CO2 uh, uh, issue, which is a harder, but it does buy us some time to get to there. So, And finally, we have choices as we move forward in the black carbon, of course, and the CO2, and, and so now is the time to make those decisions. Thank you.